This is Radio 314 on the Red Ice Radio Network. This is the one and only Radio 314. Today we'll be discussing breasts. Every woman has them, but many women want to change them. My guest is Susan Kolb, a medical doctor who is uniquely qualified to tell the story you're about to hear. She's a specialist in plastic and reconstructive surgery and is extensively trained in holistic medicine. Her book is called The Naked Truth About Breast Implants, From Harm to Healing. It outlines the effects of chemical and biotoxicity related to breast implants and Dr. Kolb's treatment protocols and a detailed history of the politics surrounding the breast implant controversy, as well as stories contributed by Dr. Kolb's patients. A number of prominent physicians have endorsed the book. Well, welcome, Susan. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule for us today. Well, thank you for having me on, Lana. I think it's pretty timely, too, because Black Moon Lilith entered cancer June 9th, 2013, and it's going to stay until March 4th, 2014. And Black Moon Lilith and cancer is basically a symbol of the underlying feelings related to mothers, femininity, family, and cancer rules the belly and chest breasts. So it's appropriate that we're having this conversation. It certainly is. And as you say in your book, breasts symbolize many things for women. They do. Uh, Nurturing. We should not forget that we should nurture ourselves. Well, you have quite a story graduating from med school at 24. Now you're a board-certified plastic surgeon and founding diplomat of the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine. And in your book, you say you followed the path of the wounded healer. So let's begin with the events that steered you into becoming a holistic plastic surgeon. Well, basically, the the first event that brought me on this path was um, I went with my family on vacation to Venice Beach, California, And I got this upper respiratory infection. I wasn't feeling well, so they went out and I meditated because a lot of times meditation helps, uh, helps raise your energy and helps, helps you when you're ill. And in meditation, I heard very clearly to get Dow Corning silicone gel breast implants, which was odd because we weren't using Dow Corning. We were actually using Mentor, um, a different, a different form of breast implant. But because I was an active duty major in the Air Force, and um, I could get free breast implants from my uh, colleagues at, at Scott Air Force Base. So I flew to Scott Air Force Base and got the implants. And probably without the directive, I would, I would not have done that. And because I listened specifically to the Dow Corning part, I ended up getting 25000 from the Dow Corning settlement, which just wasn't available to the other manufacturers. Wow. Well, so you were also a major in the U.S. Air Force. How did that happen? Well, it, they paid for medical school. I, um, ah, I see. Yeah, I paid my way uh, partially through college, but then by by the end of that, I went to Johns Hopkins and uh, needed some financial support to go to medical school. Well, before we dig into the subject deeper, can you tell us a quick history of breast augmentation and when it first began? Well, the first augmentation probably began... Uh, before implants were out. They injected paraffin and other things into the breast. Of course, that didn't work out very well. And I would say the first breast implants were probably in 1960. And they were made of very thick shells, silicone gel, and they had big Dacron patches on the back of them because they thought they had to scar them to the chest wall where they move. And that wasn't necessarily true, but they, they did end up having being very difficult to get out if they had the Dacron patches. So um, the early implants were actually pretty tough because the, the wall was really, really thick. The early saline implants weren't, weren't very good. They would deflate easily. They had valve problems. So we tended to go with silicone gel in, in the 70s and 80s. And in the 70s, they ended up making the shell very thin, and the implant was very greasy. And it, they would tell the salespeople to wash off the implant before they handed it to the surgeon to look at because the, the silicone would come out through the shell. So these were very defective implants. And I actually waited until 1985 when Dow Corning came out with a low bleed gel implant. And I was hopeful because I knew how easily these other ones ruptured because I actually was putting them in patients. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to wait until that one came out and that was supposed to be a better implant. It turned out that that implant also leaked at about 8 to 15 years. Mine actually started, my left one leaked at 8 years, and because one of them leaked and the others didn't, the, the right one didn't, I had a 
my symptoms were all on the left side. So I wasn't likely to say that that was just due to, you know, something else because it was definitely due to the implant, you could tell. Hmm. So um, the the next phase was when, in the early 90s, the FDA banned silicone except for, uh, it, well, especially in primary uh, augmentations or cosmetic procedures. So we switched to saline. And they had some valve problems. They had a posterior valve that didn't work well. And they they have some other valve problems. But eventually, um, at least one company, Allergan, got a valve that's pretty good. So um, right now, probably the safest implant, in my opinion, would be a uh, smooth shell. Textured are often associated with that lymphoma, that rare lymphoma. Mm. And they also flake off and get into the system and interact a lot more with the immune system. So Jeez. I would avoid texturing. I would go with smooth, saline, allergan because it has a better valve. And um, probably skip silicone gel unless you were a reconstruction. And the reason for that is if you're a reconstruction and you don't have much tissue, um, especially not much uh, tissue uh, after a mastectomy, um, saline can ripple and, and look very unnatural. So, um, yeah, I was know, reading the there's 37 chemicals used in making the silicone implant gel. That's a lot. Yeah, that, that's what Dow, Dow Chemical um, and Dow Corning didn't want the doctors to know. Uh, there's a really, really good book that you should read and your listeners should read called The Dirt Committee. It's D-I-R-T, and it has to do with document, investigation, and retrieval something. But it basically was a committee within Dow Corning that was set up to to destroy all of the documents that might be bad for the lawsuit or the class action lawsuit. By the way, that Dow Corning class action lawsuit was the largest class action in history, just to give you an idea. I mean, that's pretty large. It, it affected more, it affected women worldwide, actually. Wow. And um, so, you know, and, and attorneys don't do class actions unless there's something there. But Dow Corning hired PR people, companies to put out that the women were just greedy, there wasn't anything wrong with them, they wanted money, um, they were hypochondriacs, you know, all of the things that were out on the news. And they convinced all of the medical um, uh, society, uh, you know, talking heads to say that, um, that that there was nothing except local complications. They would admit to that, but no systemic complications. And the thing that's really odd is that the FDA partially paid for a study that was published in uh, 2001 in the Journal of Rheumatology. And it was the only study that ever, ever done that only studied ruptured silicone gel patients. And they found a high likelihood of fibromyalgia. And even the FDA comes out and says there's no evidence of systemic disease when it paid for this study. And that study is still up on the FDA web website, at least the last time I checked. So, you know, people who don't do research, I mean, I, I had to research for the book, obviously. So people who don't do research and just listen to what's on mainstream media are going to get a very skewed view. It's going to be toward the corporate, um, you know, viewpoint. And uh, people just have to learn that the FDA is not necessarily in the business of protecting the patient. Of course not. And they allow GMOs, food additives, endocrine disruptors, you name it. It's, it's all safe in their eyes. The radiation that you, that you go through the airport. Yep, that's right. Yep. You have to opt out that's of that. Right. So at what point did you begin to look into the possibility of breast implant disease or silicone poisoning? Well, you know, I, I had... Um, it was interesting. In medical school, I was given the task of writing a review paper on the complications of breast implants. So at that point in time, I had reviewed the world's literature on complications. So I was real familiar with the different, you know, the pathology and the, and the, the capsular contracture, the gel bleed, everything from uh, what was in the world's literature at that time. And then, um, then I was guided to get breast implants when I was in the military. And I started seeing people sick from breast implant disease probably where I started recognizing it was, was about 
in in 1990, about when the when the news broke. And I think that was because it takes a while for for people to get ill. And um, I think I started well, I started to get ill uh, probably eight years after 85. So I I started to get ill probably in 93. And I didn't get explanted until 97. And and that was because um, the, one of the settlements, there was two settlements. The smaller settlement, the 3M settlement, required the women to get their implants out before December of 96. So I had this big, long waiting list of people who wanted to get their implants out, and I couldn't put them off because then they wouldn't be able to get their settlement. So I ended up getting my explant in 97 January of 97 because of that, that deadline. Hmm. Well, thousands of women are told oh, breast implants are safe and they'll last you a lifetime, but have studies even researched the effects past 10 years of what it does in your body? Well, the engineering data is that there's a lipolysis reaction or a breaking down of the shell, which is silicone, but it's a different kind of silicone, obviously. It's solid. And silicone, which is hydrophobic, it has a bunch of hydrophobic chemicals, and it itself is hydrophobic. In other words, it can go through cell membranes. It doesn't necessarily dissolve very well in water, but it, it goes through fat pretty well. Um, it can leak out, and it starts to leak before it ruptures, and there really is no test other than clinical um, criteria for determining that, that it's leaking. And I see silicone lymph nodes in the axilla full of silicone without a rupture. Uh, surgery is more difficult if it is ruptured, obviously. Um, now, they've got those low, low bleed, um, not low bleed, but low, the highly cohesive gel implants now. And that does make it nicer for us to get it out because the silicone doesn't run all over the chest wall, the instruments, and the floor. But um, it still doesn't prevent the woman from getting sick. Uh, if, the, if the implant leaks, and you can tell because when you take the implant out, one, the one that didn't leak is fine. It looks like it did when it went in. The one that leaks is real, real um, obviously has a volume uh, deficit, mm -hmm. and then usually that side has uh, lymph nodes that are enlarged, and the, and the woman is sick from silicone toxicity and chemical toxicity from the 30 or so chemicals that are in it. So what are some of your protocols for removing the silicone in those hard to get areas? Well, when we go in, we try to stay at, there's a procedure called in block, which is spelled E-N and then B-L-O-C. I think it's French. Anyway, it means to go in, encounter the shell, dissect around the shell, and then try to get the whole thing out without rupturing it. Uh, outside the shell. That doesn't work, by the way, if they have an extracapsular rupture because it's already ruptured through the cell. But we, we try to do this to prevent silicone from spilling. Then we'll make a small incision in the axilla and remove any silicone-laden abnormal lymph nodes. We don't do an axillary lymph node dissection, so there's not a risk of um, lymphedema. But we try to get out as much silicone as we can and then the rest of it is gotten out through a silicone chemical and biotoxin detoxification protocol. This, this foreign body, by the way, is infected. It's infected with yeast, mold, and often bacteria. Mm. So we often have to treat with, um, with uh, antibiotics and antifungals and do biotoxin detox because when you kill off a bunch of the fungus and the body can't get rid of the biotoxin, that's about 25% of the population, then they get deathly ill. I mean, they don't, they won't die, but they feel like they're dying. Yeah. Yeah. In your book, you told the story of a woman who had her implants removed and the saline water was actually black, which was consistent with yeah. fungus. Wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty outrageous. I mean, what would your yeah, average was, plastic surgeon do if they saw that? Just nothing? Oh, that's all right. We'll just replace it. They usually just put another implant in, which is a really bad idea. One, one great story is a woman I had who every time somebody hugged her, she'd have an anaphylactic reaction. <laughs> and when we took her implant out and sent it to Mycometrics, which looks at mold, she had penicillamine in her implant. She was allergic to penicillin. So the penicillamine was making penicillin. Wow. So how does the and, fungus uh, even get there? Through a faulty valve. Um, if you're in, say, a hurricane and you evacuate and then you come back and sleep on a multi-mattress or in a multi-house, you'll breathe the mold in 
and if it's a certain pathological mold, it'll get in your bloodstream, and it lands on foreign foreign bodies. Mm. Um, there was an article in the British literature where mold was found both inside the implant. These are saline implants, not mm. silicone, and then around the implant. And I've seen black mold around a silicone implant, and the woman had pericarditis from the aspergillus because mm. it was right there. I mean, it goes right through the right through the um, connective tissue, and the heart is right there. Do you think any of this has to do with the high suicide rate with women who have breast implants? Their brains are literally being yeah. infected. Yeah, you know, if a woman doesn't have a good support system, uh, health insurance, a husband that just doesn't decide to divorce her because she doesn't she doesn't work and she loses interest in sex because her testosterone is like nothing. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that happens is your entire endocrine system gets wiped out. So you have thyroid problems. So you have uh, your hair falling out. You're constipated, you have dry skin, you have a lack of ADH, which um, leads to you drinking and peeing all the time, and if it's bad enough, can lead to retinal detachment and can also lead to you bleeding in surgery. And plenty of surgeons, very few surgeons know that you may have to give desmopressin during surgery to prevent bleeding if they're bleeding. I mean, if you see somebody bleeding like aspirin bleeding and they weren't on aspirin, then you need to des desmopressin in order to make it so you don't have a large blood loss and maybe a hematoma. So, um, and then the, the sex hormones go away. I went into a premature menopause, and um, which makes it interesting now because I probably still have eggs. So that's very interesting. I'm 58, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's exactly how women have babies at 60 without meaning to. Mm. Um, and then uh, your adrenals go. So you have adrenal fatigue. You feel really tired. You can get weak and dizzy. And then it also affects the neurological system uh, with mold biotoxins. So you have blurred vision. You can often have numbness, tingling, all sorts of weird neurological things, fasciculations, even up to seizures. And then also um, your immunological system's affected. So your natural t killer T cells go away. I believe this is along with the carcinogens is why people have a high cancer rate. Not breast cancer, but other cancers. And um, actually, silicone prevents breast cancer fourfold. So that's kind of an interesting statistic. Really? Explain that. Mm -hmm. it, it has to do with pressure. It's well known that pressure can prevent cancer. Um, silica and cytokines. One of the cytokines is tumor, tumor necrosis factor. One of the reasons these women have so much chest wall pain is because of massive release of cytokines when the macrophage which is a cell that eats things, tries to eat the silicone. Silicone is toxic, breaks up in the macrophages, and there's high interleukin-2 tumor necrosis factor. So it's kind of weird, but there's less breast cancer. Oh, well, I was going to ask about that because some ladies, they go, you know, it's, it's a cruel process. They remove their breast, and then they put some other foreign body in there. I wondered if that was going to create cancer again, but I guess not. Not in the breast. It has increased risk of breast cancer. No, I'm sorry, increased risk of brain cancer. Um, pancreatic, lung, and some other ones. So those are much worse cancers than breast cancer. Much worse. So what do you think of Angelina Jolie's double mastectomy as a preventative measure? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Um, I'm one of the contributing authors in a book called Goddess Shift, Women Leading for a Change. Mm -hmm. And one of my co-authors is Angelina Jolie. Ah. <laughs> so <laughs> very interesting. Oh. My my chapter is all about the dangers of breast implants, so uh. perhaps she didn't read it, but perhaps she will. Uh oh. <laughs> but uh, you never know. So, do you think, speaking on a spiritual side, do you think that maybe also the health of the soul of a woman could be making symptoms worse, and then she's developing this breast implant disease? Well, I think more than anything, the the pattern that I see is that women, uh, the small still voice, which is you know, probably most likely coming from the soul or guides or angels, is telling them not to get breast implants. And they disregard it. And I think that, you know, this is this is one of the more common themes. Sometimes they get implants to save a marriage, they get implants to keep a boyfriend, they get implants for the wrong reasons. And I'm I'm not anti implant. I mean I currently have breast implants. I I don't believe that any implant is is totally safe and what I try to do is educate people on what you can do to have implants 
without sacrificing your health. I mean, mm-hmm. unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but everything has a risk benefit. You know, I mean, if you look at people that ride motorcycles, um, you know, there, there's some really bad things that happen on, to people on motorcycles because people in cars don't see them. And they really get to use their intuition a lot. It, it's, real, it's really true. You should never ride your motorcycle when you're not feeling well, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you're kind of dulled, you know, because... Because these people who are, who ride know that they have to keep an eye on everything. Mm-hmm. You know, they they do. I treated a lot of motorcycle accidents in the in the emergency room. So, you know, the point is, a lot of us have um, intuition that is very protective, and the more we can use that intuition, the better. I don't believe everybody is going to get sick from their breast implants. I mean, if you change them out every 10 years, if you invo- avoid moldy places, if you keep your immune system good, I think that, you know, you can probably have breast implants. Um, but that's not necessarily what doctors are te- and the implant companies are telling the women, or in the past anyway. Yeah, because not all women get it for vanity reasons, but they're, they have deformities or cancer or an accident maybe, right? Yeah, I didn't. I never developed breasts because I was radiated when I was uh, in sixth grade. Yeah, I read that. Had chest X-rays every day. So I look like a cancer patient without my implants in. So, you know, I'm. But you know, I I obviously got that disease so that I wouldn't. My breast buds would get radiated so that I would get implants because I don't think I would have just without having no breasts. And um, you know, I think my path is that of helping. Uh, discover what this disease is, how you treat it, how you prevent it, and um, you know, being the voice that women need to hear to get well. Um, other doctors really don't have a clue about this, and the only doctors that might be able to understand it would be integrative holistic physicians who are board certified in, in that branch of medicine, because they're the only ones that understand functional medicine, detoxification, and uh, and and toxicology, you know, how, how things are are um, poisoned. You know, I, I do radio shows similar to what you do, and I interview a lot of toxicologists, rheumatologists, um, you know, environmental doctors who are experts on mold. And all of these things, um, I, I wouldn't have been able to write the book without the input from all of these various subspecialists. Well, it's also interesting because it seems like candida is really taking over and all these other bacterial infections just in humanity at large. I don't know if it's the diet, (laughs) the environmental stressors, but something's going on. I think we have an immune um, issue. And uh, I I personally believe it's from the GMO. I believe that especially soy GMO depresses the immune system because I saw it do that myself and some other people. I think the majority of soy is GMO, so be careful ordering soy, you know, at the Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Um, now, if you go to Whole Foods, and you can be pretty sure that, although who, Whole Foods recently said they can't guarantee that there won't be GMO in their in their foods, which is interesting <laughs> and true. <laughs> you know, I, I understand yeah. why they said that, but you know, if you had a source of soy that was not GMO, then I wouldn't I wouldn't be opposed to it, but. Um, if you're drinking soy milk, you might want to instead drink almond milk. Almond milk has small uh, small doses of cyanide in it. I drink it. lots of it's that. I, <laughs> I love almond milk. Yeah, me so too. Almond milk will probably start killing cancer cells in your body, you know, the straight cancer cells. And soy will not, you know, as you know, soy can depress your thyroid. Mm-hmm. So if you have um, uh, hypothyroidism, subclinical hypothyroidism, which a huge number of people seem to have, probably from the plastics acting as endocrine disruptors. So uh, soy is not necessarily your friend um, if you have these things. Yeah, I stay away from it. (laughs) So also, most likely there must be a chemical reaction happening with the chemicals we use in and on our bodies and around us in the environment, creating some kind of new monster diseases that are unclassified by modern medicine, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you would be surprised how much silicone is in, like, fabric softener, skincare products. Um, dimethicone is is one of the silicones. It's, you might not know it's a silicone from looking at it. By the way, silicon is an element 
not I mean silica or silicon is not silicone. Yeah. So if you see silicon in something that's that's silica is not necessarily bad. Silica is what sand is made of. Exactly. And it's um close to carbon. I think it's the next uh, line up on the periodic chart. So um you know you don't have to be fearful of silica. It actually helps your bones. It's very helpful for your bones. So um, we're not asking you to avoid everything with with the scylla in it. It's just the plastics. And actually, you need to avoid plastics in general, especially heated or frozen plastics, because that can also be an endocrine disruptor. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Pretty much everything. A lot of the toxic household, we talk about this all the time, from makeup to hair to cleaning products to things mm -hmm. in your car. Everything is an endocrine disruptor, so you have to really be careful what you're buying and read labels. And also what you spray. I've had a number of patients working in an enclosed space spraying things, and they didn't realize that they really should read the bottle that says don't use it in an enclosed space. And silic silicon was in the spray. Mm -hmm. And of course, they breathed it in and got, you know, some pulmonary complications. <laughs> so. so how do you find out if someone is struggling with biotoxins? Is there a way to test that? We use a visual contrast sensitivity test, which is an eye test that is really very, as, as long as you don't have something wrong with your eye, like you're blind in an eye or something, um, is very sensitive test. If a woman only has mold in her left breast implant, only her left eye will be abnormal. Wow, interesting. So if a woman comes in with breast implants and says, I don't feel well, what's the first thing that you do? Well, I take a careful history. Um, I had a woman come in the other day. She had sil silicone implants that um, her visual contrast sensitivity was normal. She had really amazing neurological symptoms. It were just really flagrant neurological symptoms and very debilitating. And you would, on cursory view, you might think they're biotoxin symptoms, but with a normal visual contrast sensitivity test, and in fact, she's silicone, not saline, um, I started asking her about aspartame. She denied using aspartame, but I said, there's something you're doing every day. Every day you do this. And she said, could it be the gum I'm chewing? And I said, yep, it could be the gum. Mm. And so she went out to her car, and it was sugar-free gum with aspartame in it. Now, she's going to stop the aspartame, and I believe that the majority of her neurological symptoms will all go away. Now, you know, so we don't just rip breast implants out because somebody has symptoms and happens to have breast implants. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you only take them out if they're causing the trouble. Hmm. You also emphasize the importance of removing scar capsule. What is that? Well, the silicone and as, and also the biofilm gets into the capsule, the scar tissue around. And so, and if you leave it in, it can get fluid in it and it can cause all sorts of problems. The peer-reviewed literature and the plastic surgery literature recommends taking it out because of all these complications that can occur if you leave it in. It can be um, mistaken for cancer. It can, you know, get infected. It can get a seroma in it. So we, we really think that it's important to get the scar tissue out. And um, so that not all surgeons take it out. And so a lot of people ended up, end up having two surgeries. And if your surgeon isn't treating with antifungals around the time of surgery, they don't understand the disease you have because everybody has either yeast or mold that needs to be treated. It's a big part of what the illness is. Yeah, definitely. Another interesting thing is that FDA recommends yearly MRIs to check if silicone implants are ruptured. <laughs> Isn't that oh, going to... That's terrible. You get <laughs> gadolinium poisoning. I was looking at... Somebody emailed me yesterday. How do you get gadolinium out? Because their hair analysis, they had like buku gad gadolinium. Mm -hmm. And so I go online, right? Mm -hmm. Guess what? I'm not sure how you can get gadolinium out. But you can get a disease. If you have too much gadolinium, you can get a really severe disease with pain and fibrosis and kidney failure. So be careful. Be careful about getting MRIs with gadolinium. That's with contrast, um, especially if you're dehydrated. That's well known. So, you know, getting MRIs, they won't detect leaks. I recommend people get um, ultrasounds because... If you go to somebody who's really good, and the guy across the street from us here in Atlanta is really good, um, they can tell if an implant is leaking or ruptured on ultrasound. Not every doctor can, but he can. Mm. 
Now, tell us about Morgellons disease in patients with silicone implant disease. Well, Morgellons, um, I've, I've found five of my patients with Morgellons who are eating a lot of lunch meat, like lunch meat every day. Mm. And Dr. Uh, Hildegard Staninger, who's a toxicologist, had discovered that the fibers coming out of the Morgellons patients were sil silicone and high-density polyethylene. And the lunch meats were being sprayed with high-density polyethylene. So this is an example of eating, well, eating one plastic and having another plastic in your body because your implants are ruptured and then possibly causing a problem that could lead to fibers coming out of your body. Yikes. Are there any peer-reviewed papers ever that have studied women with ruptured breast implants? Just the one that the FDA partially paid for, and that was the one that found a fairly high incidence of fibromyalgia, which, by the way, fibromyalgia is either chemical or biotoxicity or in some cases, intracellular disease like mycoplasma. Many women with um, immune deficiencies will have, I mean, we get them better and then they don't get completely well and we find they have mycoplasma, so we have to treat that as well. But that's just part of the immune deficiency. Yeah, exactly. It's a toxicity or deficiency of some kind. We had on, on Red Eyes a lady, Allison Adams, who was a, she's an ex-dentist and she talks about uh, mercury poisoning and she experienced her, basically her health her whole health declined, and she experienced mm -hmm. fibromyalgia, and it was just mercury poisoning, basically. Well, mercury poisoning, will, and we recommend people get their fillings out as part of cleanup, but mercury will cause high levels of yeast in the gut, and the yeast is protective because the yeast actually eats the mercury and prevents it from causing neurological problems. So you have to be careful. that That's why we do a hair analysis to see if people have high levels of mercury. Um, but we recommend they get mercury out anyway if they can because it's just much easier to control the candidiasis with the mercury out. Hmm. Now, what about breastfeeding with implants? Because in your book, you said evidence has now begun to accumulate that children born after a woman has these devices implanted are likely to be in poor health. Well, the um, two, two areas that we found uh, were neurological problems. That was probably from the platinum and uh, immune problems. The immune problems, we're not sure which chemicals it was related to. It might be that the chemicals cause, uh, you know, a T cell uh, deficiency. But um, that's what we see if the implant's defective and the woman breastfeeds with a defective implant, that's what we can see. And usually the woman is sick as well. Mm -hmm. You also tell a story in The Naked Truth about... Um a lady, an FDA scientist, right? She became ill after receiving smooth saline implants because she had a different kind of genotype. Can you talk about that? Yeah, she was, yeah, she was, um, well, she thought they were safe too because they were FDA approved, right? <laughs> anyway, she, she called me up and I said, I listened to her story and I said, I think you have B27, HLA B27, which is a genetic type. And she did. She got tested for it. She did. And that's why it says on the small print in the, in the little thing that the, the guy's supposed to read before he puts breast implants in you. Uh, do not use these if the woman has a family history of autoimmune disease. So mm -hmm. it's really covered because B27 almost always have a family history of autoimmune disease. Oh, interesting. And they get sick right away. Um, I had one uh, doc doctor in Germany who got deathly ill. She was she was a triathlon runner before she got implants. She got silicone implants. And then within five months, she was diagnosed with five different autoimmune diseases and couldn't get out of bed. Oh, jeez. So she got on, her, got on the Internet, found me, and came here. And now she's back. She's, she's healthy again. You just took them out? Yep. Hmm. Well, you say at the core of the controversy lies a larger disease. It is a systemic social and spiritual disease that affects us all. Can you explain this? Well, I think, I think that in general, the institutions that we have that are supposed to protect the public simply don't work to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the corporations pay for the research. Um, we suspect that a lot of the research is, you know, if at least I heard from women who were in the studies for the breast implants, the new ones, and then they got sick, they suddenly were not in the study. So that's interesting. Um, the, 
we just can't trust the corporations that have profit at their as their bottom line to do the studies. I you know I think I talk about maybe having a research facilities that are not able to be influenced to do the studies, to be paid to do the studies. You know, the corporations could pay people to do the studies and those people could be blinded to the corporation so they don't know who they are. Um, you know, that that could happen. Hmm. So we have to take we have to remove the corporate influence over government regulatory agencies as well as over the studies that get approval. Well, government regulatory agencies fail time and time again. They provide a horrible service. <laughs> well, they do, and it's the nature of the beast, though. I mean, it's not just there. It's a, I mean, it's all throughout government. I mean, if you didn't have people like Ralph Nader, have, have you followed his story? I mean, yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, Nader was such a a Nader actually um, was uh, uh, propositioned by um, a prostitute, and he didn't go for it. And he ended up that prostitute was hired by uh, I think GM and or one of the corporations, and he proved that that prostitute was being sent to him to compromise him, and he ended up winning like seven hundred thousand dollars. And in 1972, that was equivalent to several million. And that's what he used to start uh, Nader's Raiders. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I just love that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we get into conspiracy a little bit, I don't know what your take is on that. But do you think there is a conspiracy to keep this information quiet about silicone poisoning? Maybe another puzzle piece in the depopulation agenda, perhaps? Because 250,000 women a year in America alone are getting breast implants. That's pretty high. Well, I think that what Dow Chemical would like to keep quiet is that there's massive amounts of silicone in all sorts of stuff. You know, they say that when you get an IV, it's coated with silicone, you know, the catheter. Mm -hmm. um, there's silicone in pills. There's silicone in a lot of the food, in the, you know, in the skincare products, uh, fabric softener. You know, just if you just read labels, you'll see how much silicone there is in everything. And whether or not it's depopulation, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't say that for sure, but I do know that that um, at the same time Dow Corning was stating that silicone had absolutely no biological effect, I believe another, either another branch of Dow Corning or Dow Chemical was testing it against cockroaches, and it was killing the cockroaches. <laughs> and that's in the DIRT Committee. You've got to read the DIRT Committee. Well, maybe that's it's what they really, think is really humanity. Good. We're cockroaches, huh? That's why they tested yeah. on them. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. But, you know, I don't know intent. I do know that they were looking for anything they could to make money off of it. And, um, you know, whatever was convenient for that, agenda was what was pushed forward. The problem is that there were memos, there were meeting minutes, there were all these documents that showed that they were dis you know, disagreeing with or they weren't honest in presenting the findings of the study. You know, they, they would cover the studies up. And that's, I think that's true now even in pharmaceutical industries. They, they're, they're now showing that all these studies that don't show what they want to show are, you know, kind of like put at the back of the file cabinet and not and not brought forth. Yeah. So that's a problem. I mean, it's just a problem with the corporations doing their own research. I mean, if you have an idea, you should be able to design the studies, but those studies should be carried out by people and you don't know who they are. You just pay for them. So who is funding the safety studies of the implants? Are you saying that it is the actual the manufacturers? Companies? Well, yeah, that... <laughs> and they choose who does it. <laughs> That's why the women who get sick end up not being in the study. Now, what about these surgeons I mean, that are pushing the silicone gel? Are they getting a kickback from these companies? Some of them may be. You know, mm -hmm. some of them are uh, investigators and, you know, representatives for the companies. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I honestly believe that a lot of the surgeons don't really understand the disease. Um, some are just, you know, they keep their head in their sand. They, they, they don't want to know about it, so they don't know about it. They don't listen to women. But other ones, I think they just 
the, the disease is too complicated for them. They're not medical doctors. They're, they're not, they don't know about functional medicine. They don't know about toxicology. So it's just too complicated. It's also their bread and butter, right? Exactly. It's easier to believe that the women are just, you know, um, trying to get money or, you know, sick from something else or whatever. So if a woman really does need breast implants, what would you tell her? Well, if she's got thick enough flaps, I would recommend the smooth saline Allergan. Um, If she doesn't need a lot of tissue, I'd tell her to wait for stem cell fat transfer. Cytori is trying to get FDA approval for that. Um, It's not FDA approved yet, so be very wary if anybody says they're doing stem cell fat transfer. They're probably just doing fat transfer because the FDA comes and and gets very annoyed if you say you're doing stem cell fat transfer, unless you're part of a clinical trial. So, um, but you can get it overseas for sure. You can go overseas. Europe is doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Thailand and other places. So, you know, it's 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 being done. Uh, It's probably very safe. it's probably really but, expensive, you know, we, too. Yeah, but, you know, if it's done more, it'll get less expensive. Yeah. And once it's FDA approved, then the price will come down. Another quote from your book, you say, Mental and spiritual realms are intricately related, bound in a universal web, and in essence cannot be separated. So knowing all you know now, what is breast implant disease really telling us? It's a symptom of a chronic condition that we have. Um, implants are one, you know, are one phase of that. But like you said, the the lack of science behind nanotechnology. Um, Dr. Staninger told me that silver particles inside the nucleus denature proteins. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Has that been studied? But you can believe there's nano silver everywhere. You know, I mean, you, you, it's it's being used everywhere because it sterilizes things. So we don't know. I mean, we don't know GMO. We don't know nanotech. Uh, we certainly don't know the health effects of this massive medical and airport radiation that we're getting. These new digital mammograms and these new digital um, uh, techniques have have much higher radiation dosages. And so I, I gave a talk uh, in the Truth Convention, which you can buy online, um, an hour-long talk on the FDA. And I talked about everything except for drugs, <laughs> you know, everything else. Implants, medical medical devices, the, uh, the radiation, skin care products, um, you know, everything we've been talking about, GMO, nanotech. Um, and basically the FDA says it's up to the companies to prove safety. And then the companies don't, you know, or if they do, they're just very short term superficial studies. And so we are being, I mean, the God's honest truth, and I think you know this as a radio show host, we are being experimented upon with unknown, unknown outcomes. Yeah. Just the cell, the cell phones alone. I interviewed Dr. Carlo. You ought to interview him if you haven't. Um, he was a researcher hired to do $20 million worth of research for the cell phone companies, and he found out they really do cause brain cancer, eye tumors, parotid tumors, and acoustic neuromas because of free radicals. Well, all you have to tell people is, you know, protect your phones. There's a number of devices out there. Take melatonin before you go to bed. Three to six milligrams of melatonin will will um, undo the free radicals that you that you made all day with your cell phone. And that is how the cancer is formed, is via free radicals. So you can do things. You don't have to give up your cell phone. You, ha- you have to change things a little bit so that you don't have you know, increased risk of all of these things. Exactly. Yeah, I believe that. Well, good. I take melatonin at night. <laughs> there you go. So on your radio program, you interview all kinds of guests. So what suppressed information, if any, stands out the most? Who are some of your favorite guests you've had on? Well, let's see. Um, I interviewed a guy the other day, I don't remember his name, but the book is 2012 Create Your Own Shift. And it was um, very interesting information from all all sorts of uh, venues on uh, what the ascension is and what the changes are that we're going through now. And I just think we're in a very unique 
time period where um, a lot of the deceit and deception and secrets and and all of the negative things are going to are going to be revealed. I think I think they're going to come to light. I think the the people are going to wake up and understand things that they never understood before. And I even see a time when the mainstream media comes out from underneath its, you know, its its uh, grip from the powers that be. I think that I think that things are going to get a lot better, and people are going to get a lot smarter. Oh, but we have to protect our energy field because all these things are are chipping away at it. <laughs> it's like if we're multidimensional beings, that first that first part right here needs to be whole to make the rest of it function. Don't you think? True, but I think that with the energies coming in from the galactic center and um, with some of the things that, you know, your guests and my guests teach you about your energy field, I think we can do that. I think it's it's very, I think the future is very bright. I, I don't prescribe to the, you know, the projected future of, you know, us uh, being in civil war and being, you know, um, having to, to, go to the bunkers, so to speak, or having World War III. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. There should always be an alternative. There always will be, I think. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to keep projecting in the positive. And one of the other books I'm in is, a, is one of the authors. There's about 42 authors. It's a book called Optimism, which is edited by Stephanie Marone and published by um, uh, Dawson Church, who you may have interviewed as well. And uh, it's a book um, about being optimistic. And I think that, that that is a great book to read whenever you feel yourself being sucked down the, you know, the negative energy uh, funnel, mm -hmm. which, which uh, many of us uh, might be. But I think you can go the other way. I think you can see the, the good in everything and that things are actually improving. I mean, we, the, the whole thing about um, the NSA I mean that that being leaked is very significant. The NSA and your cell phones. Yeah. Yeah. That that's a tremendous breakthrough and at a great cost to the person who did it. I mean, but there are more and more and more whistleblowers. Um you know, I I wrote a whole book this weekend on whistleblowing. I I probably can't have him on my radio show because he's way too controversial, but there there are whistleblowers out there at every level. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, we like to talk to those. Tell us more about what you were right. working on. Well, I was reading um, Matrix Deciphered, and it's um, it's a uh, uh, expose by a former CIA and DARPA um, contractor who claims that, I think in 2004, 2005, he was actually, they tried to knock him off. And what how they did it, what he think because he was an insider, he had a lot of inside information about what was going on, and so that's something that you can. It's a little light reading, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but it gives you an idea of what's possible, and um, how uh, how prevalent it might be that that the agencies um, or at least some individuals and in agencies are misusing the power. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then you have people now saying that maybe there are some whistleblowers that are put there to actually distract the alternative media movement. Different yeah, disinformation. Yeah, yeah dis disinformation. Sure. That, that's true, too. And um, I, I never really understood. I interviewed Stephen Greer on disclosure, mm -hmm. and I never really understood Stephen's um, statement that many of the alien abductions were actually done by the CIA until I read matrix deciphered and then i got the mechanism by which they were done mm. that was what was interesting hmm. what was that mechanism <laughs> well it has to do with um over the radar i mean over the horizon harp and being e -E, well they call it eeg heterodyning sure. you got to read it it's yeah. very it's very technical Okay. So I'll do that. Well, how about your work? Has your research been suppressed or has it been accepted by the official channels? Um, I don't think my research is even published. I mean, I just read this book. Yeah. How's the book <laughs> I haven't being tried accepted? to publish anything. Um, I doubt very many people know about it, except the women. I mean, yeah. it, as far as plastic surgeons, very, very few know about it. 
um, it's not something that they're going to accept uh, unless they have a you know a lot of patients or a, a loved one close to them to get sick, and then they open their minds up. Mm. Yeah, I, I just can't. I, I can't believe that they it would ever be widely accepted. I mean, I might be surprised, but I, I doubt it. This, awesome. this book is for the women who are sick, yeah, and to to give them some, you know, some answers and some mechanisms of getting well. Yeah, and there's a lot of people more and more that are becoming really sick, and modern medicine isn't doing it for them, so they're going into holistic avenues, and then they're getting healed. So that's because they're toxic. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, mo most people don't know about biotoxins. Biotoxins are, you don't have to have mold in you to get biotoxin illness. Sick building syndrome is biotoxin illness. You can, you can at work, they can have a water intrusion problem. It can get mold in the air conditioning systems, and you can get deathly ill. And only 25% of the people in the building statistically will get ill because that's about 25%. One-fourth can't get rid of the biotoxin. Everybody else just gets a little bit of sinus and upper respiratory problems. But, every, but you get horrible fibromyalgia, can't get out of bed. And then workman's comp comes in and says, nope, doesn't exist. You see, <laughs> it's, it's not, it does not behoove the CDC or the government to recognize sick building syndrome. Right. Yeah, of course. Ugh. Too many lawsuits. It's disgusting. Well, your center is fantastic, helping women from all over the world recover, women who have been told they're crazy by other doctors. So tell us more about Plasticos Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and also Millennium Healthcare. Well, Plasticos was founded in 92, uh, I'm sorry, 95. And um, we started treating women sick from breast implants, people with really bad hand and face injuries. When I was when I was guided to build the center, it was for the disasters, you know. And then we saw we opened up Millennium Healthcare, and we saw fibromyalgia, Lyme's disease, Morgellons, um, you know, all these all these basic horrible problems, and came up with some pretty good treatment plans for them. And then in '99, we added Avatar Cancer Center, and cancer obviously is a difficult disease, and so we're working on that now and uh, getting some interesting results with that. And if someone wants to hear your radio show, where can they go? Uh, Temple of Health is plays on BBS radio as well as Plasticos.com every Saturday at, at noon to 1. Um, I would just Google Temple of Health and whatever you're interested in will come up on Google. And then before we went to BBS, we were at Radio Sandy Springs. So www.radiosandysprings.com. You go in the archives, look under Temple of Health, you'll find about three years of radio shows there too. Well, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, Lynn. It was great. And keep up the great work. You too. And to all of you, thanks for listening. You can help support us by signing up for a Red Ice membership. We do appreciate it. And since we're on the subject of women, stay tuned next for Lisa Arbacheski from Tragedy and Hope, who will be joining me to discuss the roots of the feminist movement and all that it's not cracked up to be. Take care.